Hey, what's up everybody? Today I wanted to share a little video about memory. See, I was working on a project and I needed it to be able to measure how much memory it was actually using at any given time. So I thought that would be a good topic for today because we talk a lot about memory, but you may not know how to actually have your program measure its own memory consumption. So that is the topic of today's social distancing stay at home to code lesson is basically all about memory. How do we measure memory consumption in our programs? Now, this seems like it should be really simple. I mean, how complicated of a question is it? How much memory is my program using, right? I mean, I declare variables that use as memory. I allocate more space using malloc, calloc, realloc. I might even get fancy and use mmap and map some memory or use brk to change the program break. All of these things are allocating memory, but it turns out that memory is a little bit complicated and I don't have time to give you a full virtual memory lesson that would take hours but let's go over a few things just to make sure that what we talk about in this video makes sense. So the first is that memory comes in pages. On my machine, those pages are four kilobytes in size. They're basically just chunks of memory that the operating system hands out to individual processes. So I can't just ask for one byte, I'm gonna get 4K. And let's say that I call malloc and request eight bytes. Well, I might have eight bytes that are currently unused lying around on one of my existing pages, in which case my memory consumption for my process is not going to increase at all. Now, if that's not the case, then I'm going to have to allocate a new page, and so my memory consumption will increase by 4K. And that's because my program simply can't ask for just four bytes. It has to ask for pages. And also, in case any of you are wondering how this works, processes ask for memory, typically using BRK or MMAP, at least on a Unix-based operating system. And I have videos on how those work. I'll put links to those videos in the description. But now at this point, we know that memory comes in pages. That's not too complicated. Also, keep in mind that some of those pages are shared between processes. Now, when we wanna know how much memory a process is using, there is a question about should we count the shared pages or not? In this case, I'm not going to count those because I'm mostly interested in how much memory my process had to allocate in order to handle its code and its variables, basically the things that are unique to that program, what's added because I ran that program. And so today I'm gonna to ignore shared memory as much as I can. Also, I'm not sure if you know this, but when you're running a lot of different programs, sometimes the operating system will take some of your program's pages and write them out to disk. It moves them out to disk so that it can make space for other processes to come into memory. And so we might ask ourselves, how much physical RAM is my process occupying right now? Or we could say, how much total memory in the system is my process managing? What's its memory footprint in the system? So we refer to the pages that are in memory as the resident pages, and pages that are out to disk are non-resident. So just to be clear, today I'm interested in the memory footprint of my program. Basically how much memory it's consuming, not how much memory is resident. So I'm interested in basically as much as can be brought in or the maximum resident set size. It's basically how many pages of memory will it take to fit all of my code, my variables, the heap, the stack, basically everything that I need for this program to run, minus the shared system libraries. Okay, so enough terminology and background. My challenge for today is to figure out how much memory my program's using, and I want to go through a few different options for you. So the most obvious option is just simply to use the system tools that the operating system provides you. All operating systems are going to give you some kind of tool. On Mac OS, it's the Activity Monitor. On Windows, I think they still call it the Task Manager. And this is a useful tool for humans who want to check out currently running programs. But it turns out that this is not a really great tool for programs that want to monitor themselves and their own memory consumption. So option number two we can use is PS. PS is available on Linux, Mac OS, or any Unix-based operating system. And the PS command is going to give us status information about running processes. And if I use the U option, that I'm going to get a lot of different information. And two of these pieces of information have to do with memory usage. So the first one is this VSZ, or the virtual memory size. Now this is all of the memory that my program can access in its virtual memory space. So this includes shared libraries. There's a fairly large amount of shared library stuff that these programs are all accessing. It's basically stuff that all programs have available to them. And that's why this number is fairly large for all of the programs running on my system right now. The other item is the RSS. That is the resident set size. Now, the resident set size is telling you how much resident memory the process is using. So it's ignoring any memory that has been paged out to disk. 
So it's not quite what I'm looking for, but I could use this. I could have my program simply run PS by using something like popen, and then I could parse the output and I could get the number that I want. I basically could extract this, either the VSZ or the RSS number and, and use it in my program. But that also sounds like a bit of a pain, all this parsing and stuff just to get one number. I'd like something a little simpler. And so we're gonna move on to option three. Actually, let me pause and let's first talk about option 2.5. So option 2.5, I almost didn't talk about in this video because it's only available on select operating systems, but that's the proc file system. Now the proc file system is available in Linux. It's not available on my Mac, so I'm not actually gonna show you this today, but the proc file system is basically a bunch of directories with files in them that have status information about the individual processes in your machine. And this has all sorts of useful information. Again, there may be some parsing involved. They're not real files, they're, they're pseudo files generated by the operating system, but these files can give you all sorts of information about memory usage, page tables, and this is super handy. There have been so many times where I wish Mac OS would offer this to me, but they don't. So it's out there. I'm not gonna go into details on it today, but if you're using Linux, then the proc file system is definitely a good option. It's just not necessarily very portable from one operating system to another because some don't provide the procfs. But today I wanna to focus on what we can do in our programs that's a little more portable, a bit more standard, and that is going to be the get our usage function. Now, get our usage is part of the GNU standard library. It's available wherever glibc is available. Now, I just wanna warn you, not all of its features are available everywhere. I found that out the hard way, but the one we're using today, which is basically looking at the maximum resident set size, is typically available. At least I, everywhere that I've tried to use it, it's been available. Now, get our usage is short for get resource usage. And that's what it does. It basically just tells you what system resources your process is using at any given time. And if we look at the man page, you can see that it takes two arguments. The who argument just lets us specify whether we're looking at our own resource usage or the resource usage of our child processes, our children. Then we pass in a pointer to a our usage struct, and that's going to be filled with various usage related information. And if we look at this struct, there are a lot of different bits of information here, most of which I'm going to ignore for today, but you should look into them when you have the time. I'm going to focus specifically on this RU max RSS field. This is the maximum resident set size, or you can think of this as the largest our resident set could be if we loaded all of our allocated memory into RAM at once. This is how much physical RAM my process would take. And at least for today's exercise, that's what I'm after. Okay, so let's see how this works in code. So I'm gonna make a very simple bare bones C program. Main is going to just print out how much memory we're using. So this is like hello world, but prints out memory usage. And because we're going to extend this program a bit, I'm actually going to put the code that calls our usage into its own function. And then I'm just gonna have main call that function to get the memory usage. Okay, now this is basically how you do it. We could stop here today, but I wanna show you a few things. First of all, just so you can see that it actually works, let's compile it and run it. Notice is we get a surprisingly large number, probably bigger than you expected for a program that basically does nothing. Now this is memory that's allocated for a couple of different purposes. First of all, it's memory for the call stack, our code, our initial heap, and any other variables and data structures that libc sets up before main starts running. So that's why the numbers are kind of big. The second surprising thing is you'll notice that if I run this multiple times, if I run this over and over again, you notice that it doesn't always give me the same number. It's the same program. It's still basically doing nothing, but the amount of memory that it allocates varies. Sometimes we use a little more memory. Sometimes we use a little less. Now, at the time of filming, I have to admit that I don't really know why this is happening. To figure out, I would either have to use something like strace or dive into the code and actually try to figure out where there's room for variability in libc's setup code. And depending on how long the currently stay at home thing continues, I might get around to doing that one of these days. But for now, it's just a bit annoying because what I care about is my program and its behavior. And so this variation isn't helping me. It's not telling me what I want to know, which is basically how much memory usage am I incurring with my program by its behavior. So I wanna separate that out and focus on what my program is contributing. So let's just define a baseline variable. And this is going to record the memory usage that we start with. 
So I should hopefully be able to separate the changes that occur as a result of my program's behavior and the changes that are just due to libc. And each time I'm going to print out the baseline and the change from the baseline. So we'll look at these two things separately. Now, each time through our loop, we're going to malloc 100 kilobytes. Not too ridiculous, but we should definitely see our numbers change. And now if we compile it and if we run it, then things still look strange because that doesn't look like it increased enough. I mean, I just allocated 10 kilobytes 100 times. So if my math is correct, that should give me about 10 megabytes. And right now we're nowhere near 10 megabytes. So why? Well, it could be that the compiler is noticing that I'm never using this memory that I'm malloking. And maybe it's doing some really smart optimization, or maybe it's the fact that the operating system actually waits to give you the memory you ask for until you decide to actually use it, to actually write to it. So let's go back and actually write some values into this memory. And I talk a little bit about how this works in a previous video. I will link to that in the description. But for now, let's go and actually write some values into this memory. It doesn't really matter what we write but it just tells the operating system that no, we really are serious about this memory. Now in this code, I'm using all sorts of magic numbers here. Please don't do this in production code. This is a dinky little example and I'm in a hurry, so it's okay for today, but in production code, just give it a name. Okay, so anyway, now let's compile it and run it. And now our total amount of memory actually makes sense. So 10 megabytes, just as we expected. And this is actually really useful because let's say I tried to do this same thing with the activity monitor. Even if I'm doing this by hand, it's pretty tough. I mean, I would have to try to run it and then really quickly switch and hope that it catches the execution before the program disappears. And it didn't in this case. And so of course, I mean, I'd have to keep trying and I might get lucky. And I could also do something like this and slow it down. I could actually add sleeps. And so here I can just add a little bit of sleep in here so that things happen more slowly. Now, if I run it again, well, things do happen more slowly and we can see in the activity monitor that the memory needs are increasing over time and that's cool. But most of the time, I don't wanna to have to slow things down just so that I can take measurements. I mean, can you imagine if you had to do this every time you just wanna simply know how much memory you're using? That would get old really fast. So that's the main advantage of using something like get R usage rather than just inspecting things with the activity monitor. It just allows us to measure stuff that would otherwise be a bit tricky. And that's where I'm going to stop for today, people. I hope this is useful. And keep in mind that you can measure a lot of different resources with get R usage. Memory is just one of them. You can also measure things like CPU time or the number of page faults or context switches, all of which can be really interesting ways to look at program performance and overhead. And this is all really interesting stuff. And in fact, I'm actually interested in taking some of these measurements and actually using them in demonstrations for my operating systems class, which will be in the fall. But anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for staying at home and watching videos and learning how to code with me while the world gets things sorted out around us. And until next time, stay healthy and happy coding.